Upper Arlington High School Euro Bears. This is your teacher, Mr. Endress. Welcome. Thanks for watching. Let's learn some European history. In this video, I'm going to discuss the importance of Louis XIV of France, Louis XIV in French. During his reign, he was referred to as the Sun King. He shifted the seat of the French government from Paris to Versailles, and he is considered to be the model for absolute monarchy. Louis XIV certainly is an interesting figure in European history. For me, he is one of those individuals that you either love or hate. I certainly have my opinion about this man. I'll be curious to hear what you think of him. I particularly like looking at Louis XIV through the lens of leadership. He developed a method and style of ruling that was very different from anybody else before or since. I'm interested to find out what you think of his particular leadership style. Okay, let's get started. First, let's look at the context of European history in the 17th century. After the Reformation and the religious wars shake up Europe, more independent states emerge. The power of the papacy loses its grip, so by 1648, monarchs are more independent and free to do as they please. But in larger kingdoms, like France and Britain, where there is both a monarch and a powerful nobility, conflict arises. And this conflict between kings and, no and nobility is what defines our unit, absolutism and constitutionalism, during the mid to late 1600s. This unit will focus on two kingdoms, as you see here, Britain and France. And both of these kingdoms were going to witness a showdown between the monarch and the nobility. In both kingdoms, the king is going to assert his authority and power over the people, claiming that he gets his power from God, something called divine right. And the aristocracy is going to push back, claiming that they have ancient privileges that need to be respected, and that the king has a duty to protect aristocratic privileges and his people such a, and, and the aristocrats should have a say on things like whether or not the kingdom goes to war or whether or not uh, they should levy taxes. In Britain, the aristocracy are going to win this struggle, and they'll begin the 18th century with a new form of government, a constitutional monarchy. The king will have been put in his place, and the landowning nobility will rule. But then, as you see in the north, uh, or I'm sorry, as you see at the top of this chart here, things will go very differently in France. And that's the focus of our story here. The French aristocracy will be tied to the whims of the king, and the king will be an absolute monarch, free to do as he pleases. So this is the story of Louis XIV of France. He was the most powerful monarch by the late 1600s, which also made him the most revered and the most imitated. He completely subdued the aristocracy and transformed France into the most powerful country on the continent. French culture will flourish by the end of the 1600s. French art, French architecture, French theater, French cuisine, French literature, French perfume, French cologne, all these things will become the envy of Europe. France defined high culture, and the king was behind it all. So, how did Louis do it? Let's go back to the time of Henry IV, Louis XIV's grandfather. Remember that Henry IV had raised taxes by creating a new structure of French government bureaucracy, creating new positions and offices that reported directly to the crown. Henry did this for civil works projects, such as the canals that he wanted to establish. Then Henry was assassinated in 1610, and his son became King Louis XIII. But Louis XIII didn't want to rule, so his cardinal advisor, Richelieu, effectively became the head of state. Richelieu continued to use Henry IV's system of a strong, centralized government, which relied on these new government-appointed officials to collect taxes. The government officers were called intendants. Intendants. But Richelieu used this money much differently than Henry IV did. Uh, he, Richelieu, didn't worry so much about public works projects. You should remember how, during the Thirty Years' War, France first got involved indirectly into this conflict by financing Sweden's foray into the Holy Roman Empire. Because France was keen to watch the Habsburgs get annihilated during the, during the Thirty Years' War, which they, of course, don't get annihilated. They just get politically and economically weakened. 
to raise taxes needed for paying off the Swedes and then for entering the war directly in 1635, Richelieu doubled the amount of taxes that he collected through intendants. The aristocracy didn't like this, but there was a war, so they supported France and hoped that, they, that perhaps if France won, maybe there would be some sort of kickback. So Richelieu introduced a new kind of tax called the tie. And there you see the word there, and it is pronounced tie. The tie is an emergency wartime tax, and the, the aristocrats begrudgingly paid it and looked forward to the day when the war, when the war would end, the tax would be lifted, and all would, we, all would be well in the kingdom. The peasants, however, who of course had no say in any of this, they were the ones who were conscripted to go and fight in the Holy Roman Empire in a war that they didn't understand, and they rebelled against the Thai and against Richelieu. And there were four significant peasant uprisings in France during the Thirty Years' War era. Richelieu died during the Thirty Years' War, and he was replaced by another cardinal, Cardinal Mazarin. Cardinal Mazarin, as you see here, was a bit of a dandy. He lived lavishly, a quality that did not ingratiate himself to anyone as he raised taxes and sent French troops off to war. He also was not French. He was Italian. So the French didn't feel that he had France's interest at heart, just his own. Plus, he most likely was sleeping with the queen. This is Queen Anne of Austria. At the very least, the two were in love and spent a great deal of time together. Now, where was King Louis XIII during all this? Uh, he was getting sick and dying. King Louis XIII died at the young age of 41 in 1643. This was just a few years before the end of the Thirty Years' War. His son, Louis XIV, was only four years old when Louis XIII died. Since Louis XIV was so young, barely able to write his own name, Mazarin was in charge of France. Then 1648 came. The Peace of Westphalia was signed, but France continued to fight Spain, and the taxes kept being imposed. And this was enough for the aristocracy. They wanted to go just take away the taxes, down with the taxes, down with pretty boy Mazarin. The French nobility raised an army of their own against Mazarin, whose French army was mostly in the field against Spain. And so in 1648, the nobility overtook the, the city of Paris. This particular event was called the Fronde. So the Fronde is kind of a cool name for an aristocratic-led civil war. It means the slingshot, and the name comes from this. Children in the streets of Paris would enjoy slinging all sorts of awful things at carriages of the nobility. Rocks, mud, dead fish, sometimes manure. You could understand how this would be a lot of fun for kids. That image of playful kids besmirching the cars of the wealthy with all sorts of nastiness seemed the perfect metaphor for overthrowing Mazarin. The Fronde began in the important year of 1648. The aristocratic forces took over Paris, forcing Mazarin and the Bourbon family to hide in the palace of the Louvre. Louis XIV was nine years old, and this experience of being trapped in the Louvre, hearing the screaming going on outside, the jeers against his family, especially against his mom and Mazarin, watching the royal army constantly forced to repel any possible attack on the Louvre, all of this would make an indelible impression on the young Louis XIV. When Louis was 13 years old, the aristocracy seemed to have won the fight. The royal general, a Bourbon by the name of the Prince de Condé, he had been captured and imprisoned. Mazarin led, or fled into the German states. The aristocracy had control of France, and they were comfortable that they had eliminated all opposition to them ruling France themselves, the one thing they certainly didn't fear was a teenager king. But, oh, there's another image of the Fronde there. <laughs> Let's go to 13-year-old Louis XIV. So when Louis XIV was only 13 years old, he still is king. And the one thing that he declares is that he is going to rule independently. Now, remember, he's 13. And he says, I don't need any cardinal to help me rule. I'm, I'm going to rule on my own. Now, for what it's worth, Mazarin will get snuck back into the country, and he will help Louis XIV out until Louis XIV is 17 years old. 
But at this point, 1653, aristocrats had no fear. Teenager Louis made no big sudden moves that he was going to be some wild and crazy king doing bizarre things. Mazarin is not technically in power anymore. The violence of the Fronde comes to an end. And now, here's King Louis XIV. What's he going to do? Louis XIV, at this point in time, as a teenager, could have simply chosen to simply cooperate with the demands of the nobility. Uh, they could have created, essentially, a constitutional monarchy. And at this point in time in history, that might have seemed to be the smart thing to do. For at this exact moment in time, 1653, England has no king. The English parliamentary army had already captured the king of England, placed him on trial for treason, and in 1649 cut off his head and established a republic. The people were ruling England. There was no king. So the structure of European governments seemed to be changing radically with kings losing power. So the winds of history seem to be blowing in favor of the aristocracy at this point in time. So will Louis XIV cooperate with the nobility? Well, of course, you know, this is not how things are going to go for France and that King Louis XIV is going to steer France on a completely different path. In fact, it's going to be a path towards absolute monarchy where the nobility will have no power. So why does Louis do this? What, what's motivating Louis at this point in time when he's a teenager? You know, maybe he was haunted by childhood memories of the Fronde. Uh, he endured watching his family get attacked and being barricaded in the Louvre at a young age when most of us are still afraid of the dark. Uh, his mother had been publicly ridiculed. Maybe he harbored a deep fear and hatred of the nobility. Or, and we've got to posit this theory, maybe it was just that Louis XIV was one of those great men of history who was driven with this internal lust for power and a desire to change the course of history. Uh, one thing's for certain, Louis XIV will spend the rest of his life dominating other men. So, how does he do it? This is the big question. How does Louis XIV start off as a teenager king and then take France from this position of incredible royal weakness and turn it into himself into the most powerful man in Europe and France into the most powerful country in Europe. How does he do it? Okay, so I'm going to answer that question, how does Louis XIV do it, in two words. And my two words are these two words, Colbert and Versailles. Colbert you know, not to be confused with a current American late night talk show host, this Colbert, Jean Baptiste Colbert, was Louis' finance minister. Using Colbert is going to be the first way in which Louis XIV captures absolute power. And the second, second word I have Versailles. <laughs> Versailles was the royal palace and Louis' new seat of government, which is located about 11 miles outside of the city of Paris. All right, so we have to go over Colbert and Versailles in depth here. Let's start with Colbert first. Jean-Baptiste Colbert basically had two goals, or two things that he had to do for his boss. The first was to raise money for the Louis XIV, but at the same time placate the nobility. So in order to do this, Colbert is going to utilize the taxation system established by Henry IV and Richelieu, but slightly alter it so that the nobility won't complain. Doing this is going to be the first thing that Colbert does for Louis XIV. So here's how he does it. When Colbert does an audit of French finances, he finds that only 25% of the revenue collected from the French people is actually ma is, is making its way into the royal coffers. So only 25% collected makes it to the king. So it seems like a lot of money here is being lost along the way through nobility, intendants, perhaps others. Colbert established an, an efficient system where the intendants could collect taxes directly from the French people. So this money would go straight from the people to the government. But most importantly, let me show you this. Most importantly, the nobility would be exempt from the tie. So here you see in this particular image, intendants collecting the tie the emergency tax, directly from the people, and the nobility do not pay this tax. 
So this would remove any impulse to revolt or for the nobility to revolt against it. Not the people, but the nobility. So there will be no more fronds. The peasants and the merchants were, are going to bear the weight of taxation. This non-nobility, which is called the third estate, they make up 97% of the French population. And they, the masses, they're going to pay the expenses for the entire kingdom. The richest people in the kingdom, the nobility, they're pretty much not going to have to pay anything. So they feel very, very lucky. So the nobility pay no direct taxes. Hooray. They love Louis XIV. And Louis XIV loves Colbert. And the cash starts rolling in very, very efficiently. So that's the first thing that he did. Colbert did more than just efficient tax collecting. He also found innovative ways to develop the economy. But before I can get into what Colbert did, I need to clarify what type of economic system France was working with. They had not developed a more laissez-faire economic system like the Dutch. The French had a mercantilist economy, which was the traditional economic system used in most kingdoms, where the central government, which is essentially the king, owns everything in the kingdom and is responsible for economic development land and wealth distribution, as well as tax collection. So mercantilism is a state-controlled economy. Another aspect of mercantilism is how they measure wealth, how they determine you know, which countries are the wealthiest and which ones are not as wealthy as the wealthy countries. So in this system, a country's wealth is measured by bullion, or the quantity of gold and silver that it has in the royal coffers. So the goal is for a country to produce and then sell more than it imports, thus giving it a favorable trade balance. Pretty simple. They're going to make as much as they can. They're going to sell it abroad, and they're going to sell more than they import into their country. Therefore, they've got gold and silver in their coffers, and they're determined to be rich. So the more the country produces and sells, the more money goes into the royal coffers, it's deemed wealthy. So it's acquiring more money than it's spending. Pretty simple. Okay, so that's mercantilism. Now, if I can go on for just a tangent here, uh, for just a moment, uh, it's important to look at the mercantilist economies in contrast to the emerging capitalist economies, namely the Dutch. The Dutch and, to a certain extent, the English have turned loose their merchants. In a capitalist economy, individuals are not subject to government-directed production. But rather, instead of the government telling them what to do, they are free to make, buy, and sell whatever they can. This leads to more grassroots roots innovation and trade, uh, the development of joint stock companies and a stock market so that people can freely make money. In a capitalist society, the idea is when people are free to make money however they want, then they develop innovative and successful ways of acquiring that cash. And society as a whole tends to get more wealthy. So it doesn't necessarily matter how much money the government has in its treasury. Um, of course, the governments of capitalist societies do tend to get wealthy because they're still taxing their people, but that's not exactly how we're measuring wealth. So capitalism tends to be indicative of a free society where people can do whatever they want to make money, whereas mercantilism usually means that everything is being run by a king. Okay, so back to Colbert. Within this mercantilist context, Colbert has the entire land of France surveyed. He wants to know how the land can be used more efficiently. This is the, this is the king essentially using his finance minister to figure out what France can do, like who can do what in certain places in France. So um, he has, what, what he decides to do is this, Colbert has Henry IV's old canal system expanded. Uh, he's particularly successful also in establishing royal textile mills. Uh, that's why I have that nice picture of a, a French dress uh, made from cloth from a uh, French textile mills at, at this time. And also foundries, uh, metalworks, so that French clothes and French metalworks can be exported and wealth can be obtained for Louis the Sun King. So that's what he does. Uh, for what it's worth, Jean-Baptiste Colbert had a rather frosty personality, and because he had a 
frosty personality. He was cold, and therefore his nickname was the North. <laughs> so Colbert the North is what he was known in the Palace of Versailles. Uh, he was not necessarily a friendly or happy man, but he was a shrewd economist in the mercantilist tradition. Uh, his king, the Sun King, he wanted money, and Colbert, he delivered. France was getting rich, and the money was going straight to the king, and while the commoners of France, that 97%, the third estate, while they were feeling a squeeze, the nobility wasn't complaining a whit. Colbert was helping Louis XIV achieve his objective of absolute monarchy. You're looking at Colbert, guys. He's a mercantilist genius. There he is. Okay, so the second thing I need to discuss in terms of how Louis XIV established an absolute monarchy, oh, and there it is. The Palace of Versailles. Now, before I talk about the palace, there's first the village of Versailles. Versailles is a village uh, in, in the suburbs, which, well, it's a suburb of Paris today. Uh, today, you can easily get to it by a bus or a metro ride. A, a metro, the metro is the Paris subway. Uh, Louis XIII had a hunting lodge there in the village of Versailles. Remember that Louis XIII didn't really want to rule and had plenty of time to hunt while leaving affairs as uh, leaving the affairs of state to Richelieu and then later on Mazarin. His son, Louis XIV, though, Louis XIV was interested in getting away from the big city of Paris, all the commoners and the stink of the city. And most historians believe that it was the memories of the Fronde which haunted Louis XIV and inspired him to move the French government out of the palace of the Louvre in Paris and into this little suburban town of Versailles and just take his dad's hunting lodge and expand upon it significantly. So this is going to be a monumental architectural feat as the grounds of Versailles, especially since the grounds of Versailles are mostly swamp. He's gonna literally build a palace on a swamp. So the Palace of Versailles, which of course you can still visit today, is quite spectacular. So here's a couple of aspects of the Palace of Versailles. In the front of Versailles, Really, the room right above the entrance is the king's bedroom, and it faces east. So it greets the rising of the sun, perfect for the sun king. Now, on the opposite side of the palace, the back of the palace, there is a very, very long hall that you see here with large floor-to-ceiling windows facing west so that the evening sun may pour in. And then as you see here, the wall opposite of those windows are covered with mirrors. So it reflects all, the, all that evening sunlight. So it was to be a room without any shadows, where everything would glow for the Sun King. And this particular room is the most famous room in Versailles. It is called the Hall of Mirrors. And it's in this particular room that several significant events, uh, events throughout European history will occur. Uh, this is not the last time we will talk about the Hall of Mirrors. And then outside of the palace are the extensive gardens, which feature bushes and floral arrangements trimmed and pruned in perfect geometrical forms, demonstrating man's power over the natural world. A metaphor for Louis XIV's absolute power over everything. Lining the long walkway behind the palace are statues of classical gods, especially the god Apollo, who is, of course, the sun god. Versailles itself was an architectural statement of absolute power, but it's what's going on inside the palace where Louis XIV found his genius for governance. Uh, what you're looking at here is the statue of Louis XIV that greets all the tourists as they are walking into the front entrance of Versailles. Louis XIV established a court system and a system of rituals whereby he could assert absolute control over all of the nobility. The court of Versailles during the reign of Louis XIV had to be one of the most exciting, strange, frivolous, awful, sometimes scary, sometimes ecstatically fun places one could have ever visited throughout the course of European history. Here's what he did. It would start off simply with an invitation to certain nobility. But this invitation, of course, wasn't an invitation. It was a command. Your king tells you to show up to his palace while you come. Now, this in and of itself is kind of a step in an interesting direction. 
uh, Louis XIV is embracing, or at least seeming to embrace the nobility, inviting him into this big, huge, gorgeous palace. So you would not deny the invitation. Uh, if you did so, that would be more than just a social snub. You'd easily find yourself without land and titles of nobility, and he'd take those things away from you and give them to another nobleman. And you would lose your noble rank. So already, a system of competition is sort of being established between the nobility. Louis is devising a way to divide and conquer the nobility. Uh, so once you arrived into the Palace of Versailles, Things got both exciting and strange. There are two aspects of the Court of Versailles that I focus on that dominated everything else. And these two things, as you see here, are court ritual and partying. So we are going to talk about ritual first. Every day in Versailles was governed by ritual surrounding the king. Almost every moment of every day, there is ritual. For example, there was a ceremony for having the Sun King get up out of bed in the morning and getting dressed. It was called the Rising of the Sun, or La Leve. Naturally, of course, in the end of the day, there was a ritual for the king going to bed, called the Setting of the Sun, or Le Descende. There were ceremonies throughout the day. There was a long, elaborate 14-course meal for dinner. Now, if you had done something to please the King of France, you might be among the select nobility to play an important role in one of these rituals. For example, you might get to play the role of helping the king step into his pants in the morning during the ritual of the rising of the sun. Or you might be select enough to you know, help him pull off his shirt in the evening ritual of Le Descende, the setting of the sun. You might be lucky enough to hand him his dessert at dinner time uh, during one of the courses in the elaborate dinners. So you might think that this is you know, silly or completely absurd, but if you knew that being this individual, doing the silly thing, might provide you with greater land, greater wealth, greater security for your family, you'd probably do it. So here's what's happening. Instead of attacking the nobility outright, Louis invited most of them to live with him in the greatest palace of all of Europe. They would then be in close proximity. It seemed like he was embracing them. But of course, he didn't really embrace a lot of them. He, he was pretty cool to, uh, to all of them. He didn't really pay them much attention, forcing them to compete for his attention. Then he would provide them with an opportunity to compete, compete among each other to participate in one of these rituals. That would assure the victor greater wealth. So the, no, the nobility did all they could to flatter the king. They would try to outdo each other with compliments. They would try to dress up nicer than everybody else. There would be overly eccentric etiquette. Now, if you ever dared to think that engaging in such fripperies were silly, that was fine. If you didn't want to play the game, that was fine. But then you might find out that you received no favors whatsoever, and then you might be asked to go home, only find that your property had been transferred to a more compliant nobleman. So, if that was the situation, you were in a situation, you would be forced to compete for the king's attention in the Palace of Versailles. So, you'd be catty. <laughs> Wit and charm were prized in this situation, but better yet, insults were prized. You could build yourself up by putting others down. King Louis XIV especially loved it when noblemen devised an insult that was so biting that the other noblemen couldn't match it with a quick comeback. So, here we have the birth of the French insult. Life in Versailles, it had to be excruciatingly awful for much of the French nobility, but at the same time, it had to be fun. Because the other thing King Louis XIV did, which adds only to the surrealism of the court of Versailles, was to have constant parties. Uh, gambling and playing cards was perhaps the most common activity, but there was also music and dancing, theater, fireworks, yard games, lots and lots and lots of French wine, 
in this wild and crazy amoral atmosphere, it's not hard to imagine that sexual dalliances were commonplace. It would have this this the Versailles would have been a Puritan's nightmare. But for the nobility, the partying was probably a welcome relief from spending the day observing proper etiquette and being involved in the endless rituals. Out of Louis XIV's court of Versailles, French high culture was created. Even still today in the 21st century, the world still looks to the French for high fashion and sophisticated culture. And here's where it started. Louis the Sun King's Court of Versailles. Fashion, perfumes, colognes, cuisine, wit, humor, insult, and only the best will do. All of this began at Versailles. And French theater also flourished and really developed at Versailles too. One of France's greatest playwrights emerged during the era of Louis XIV, and his name was Moliere. Moliere achieved success by writing plays that flattered the king and mocked everyone else. He mocked nobility, he mocked morality, he mocked tradition, he mocked the church. His zings, his barbs, his insults could match Shakespeare's any day. He was a poet who could make you laugh at humanity with all of its silly superficiality, while at the same time you realize that it's people like you that Moliere is mocking. One of his plays, Tartuffe, mocked the hypocrisy of the Catholic clergy. It was sort of the Decameron of its day. And although the French Catholic Church wanted it banned, Louis enjoyed it so much that it was that, that Louis XIV had Moliere put on a production of it in Versailles. So at this point, I hope you're getting a good sense of how Louis XIV ruled through Colbert's clever taxation system and Louis's own personally devised court of Versailles. He reigned in the nobility with tax breaks, rituals, and partying. Louis XIV gained complete control over France. The sad thing for France was Louis made a lot of bad decisions regarding the long-term economic stability of his state. He waged endless wars against his northern neighbors, the Netherlands. Louis XIV was je very, very jealous of their relative wealth. He also attacked his neighbors to the east, the Germans, for their lands and their resources right next door. But there was one person more than anybody else in Europe who was willing to stand up to this aggression of the French under Louis XIV, and that was the Dutchman William of Orange. Yes, William of Orange. You've heard this name before. He is that descendant of that other William of Orange, that previous William of Orange, sometimes called William the Silent, who fought the Spanish during the Wars of Dutch Independence. This new William of Orange that you see here rallied an international military force to strike back at the French to end these invasions. These wars that France fought against William of Orange will nearly bankrupt France by the end of Louis XIV's reign. Colbert had to keep production up and French goods selling both domestically and abroad to keep money coming in to appease Louis XIV and all of its spending, the court of Versailles and constant wars. And that, in the end, didn't help the French economy out much after Louis XIV passes away. These wars, sadly, also won't bode well for the Dutch. The constant French invasion meant that they too had to spend an excessive amount of money on war, and this put an end to the Dutch Golden Age. In 1685, Louis XIV issued the Edict of Fontainebleau, which revoked his grandfather's Edict of Nantes. You remember the Edict of Nantes that allowed for Huguenots who could to have their own regions, uh, to print their own books, uh, to have equal access to education and health care, it provided religious tolerance for the Huguenots. This Edict of Fontainebleau, passed in 1685, decreed that everyone in France must now be Catholic. This will now force all of the Huguenots to flee France. This might seem incredibly ironic because his grandfather, the, <laughs> Henry IV, Henry of Navarre, was the Huguenot leader. But never mind all that, it seems like the Bourbons have changed completely by this point in time. Louis proclaimed that France is going to be a land of one king, one law, one faith. This is the pinnacle of absolutism. 
And aside from this just being mean and discriminatory, it was actually very, very bad for business for France. Being anti-Catholic and independent, most of the Huguenot merchants and manuf were, were merchants and manufacturers. Huguenots were merchants and manufacturers. So when they get kicked out of France, so are all of these businesses. And many of the Huguenots fled, to no surprise, to other Protestant lands that would welcome them. So the city of Berlin and Brandenburg, Prussia, welcomed them with open arms. The Netherlands up north, that's no surprise. They're Calvinists, so they go up there. Geneva, no surprise. England, also Protestant with a, with a Puritan, uh, Puritan minority there. They're going to go there. And of course, Canada as well. Um, in particular, it's worth mentioning that they go to Berlin. Uh, the great elector, uh, Frederick William, uh, uh, who is the king there, he is uh, he welcomes them with open arms because he knows that they're merchants and and they're they're going to be good for business. And he's that the economy of Brandenburg Prussia is going to improve when the Huguenots show up. So it's also worth noting that a new French word develops at this time to describe these people fleeing their homeland of France, and that's the word that we see here, a refugee, which is of course a word that we still use today to describe anybody fleeing their homeland, usually desperately in search of a new home and a stable life. And then there's the Jansenist. The Jansenists were another group that Louis XIV attacked. Now the Jansenist, they're Catholic. These people are Catholic, but they're kind of weird Catholics. They're Catholic ascetics who believed in predestination. So they're very similar to Calvinist in that way. Um, they seem to be sort of Catholic Calvinist, but they believe in predestination and they're disgusted with the sinfulness that they see all around them in French society, especially French society as it's developing under the reign of Louis XIV. So what the Jansenists attempted to do was live in certain cloisters, certain monasteries, certain nunneries, essentially as ascetic hermits. Both the Pope and Louis XIV identified this Jansenist group as heretics, and Louis XIV had their cloisters destroyed and the Jansenists imprisoned. Probably, they were just simply too weird for Louis XIV, he probably didn't know what they were up to, they're acting different from the rest of French society, they're weird, destroy their cloisters, lock them up. And that's how he responded. So these decisions that Louis XIV is going to wear, that he's making, his, his decisions are going to wear down the French economy over time. Uh, however, this did not tarnish Louis XIV's incredible reputation as the most powerful monarch of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. He was envied and he was imitated. Louis XIV was the king of France for 72 years. This is the longest reign of any monarch in European history. It's almost the longest reign of any monarch in world history. Pharaoh Ramses II ruled longer than Louis XIV, though. Uh, and he ruled from 1643 to 1715. The most famous quote attributed to Louis XIV, which he probably never said, was this. L'état, c'est moi, or... I am the state. This certainly captures the spirit of his reign over France. This is a nice, easy quote to memorize and to use if ever you have to write an essay about Louis XIV. So here we are. You know, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of Louis XIV, Louis the Sun King? Uh, his leadership style was perhaps the most unique and arguably successful, at least in the short term, of any monarch in European history. I personally like to try to imagine what Louis XIV would be like if he was around today. It, I, I try to imagine him as a CEO of a major corporation. And I wonder, you know, would he be able to control like his middle management through rituals and parties, maybe at some exclusive resort in Hawaii or someplace so that he could establish absolute power over them and get them to do whatever it is that he wanted them to do? No, I wonder if something like this would be possible today. I don't think so, but, you know, maybe. <laughs> so what do you think about Louis XIV's leadership style? Hopefully we'll have some, t some time to discuss this in class. I'm curious to find out what you think. So that's it, Euro Bears. I hope you enjoyed this presentation on Louis XIV. I'll see you in class, guys. Hey there, Euro Bears. 
Hope you enjoyed watching the video. Michael and I have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask you to make sure that you understood everything. So uh, our first question we wanted to ask you is, why the late 17th century for the rise of the absolute monarchs? Why did absolute monarchs arise in the late 17th century? Historical context is important. Why not uh, the 14th century? Why not, why not the early 21st century? What was special about the late 1600s that allowed for absolute monarchs like Louis XIV to come to power? The uh, next question, the next question, what was the influence of the Fronde on Louis XIV? And the uh, next question after that, Louis XIV became an absolute monarch. So how did he do it? How did he do it? Uh, what, uh, what, what decisions did he make uh, that allowed him to become an absolute monarch? And then after that, how about uh, religion? Uh, how did Louis XIV treat religious minorities in France? So there you go. There's some good questions for you. Can you answer those questions? Those are all important things to know. Michael says, uh, good luck, Hero Bears. Good luck, Hero Bears. That's what he says to you. <laughs> so there you go. Thanks for watching the video. Uh, have a nice day, and I'll see you guys in class.